Hi, my name is Ann Smith, and I'm here with uh, the CEO and co-founder of Project Bazia. Uh, and he's sitting right over here, Anthony Bazia. And we have a special guest today. Um, this young lady's name is Adaraksh Oriem, but nobody ever calls her that. <laughs> we call her Tutu, and I think your family calls you Tutu, and that's a lot easier to remember. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, cultural change and how difficult it is for um, immigrants to come to a new country and find that everybody is living certain ways, uh, and sometimes very subtle things that they don't notice right away. Uh, we're going to talk particularly about gender roles, how gender roles change when you move to a different culture, and uh, how can, this can be difficult for the family to deal with. But I'm going to ask Tutu to... Uh, talk first. And um, Tutu, where were you born? I was born in Khartoum, Uganda. Well, in Khartoum, Sudan, right? No, it's in Uganda. Oh, okay. Um, and what's your birthday? February 26, 2002. Okay. And so you lived there until you were about uh, three years old? Yeah. And then you came to the United States. Uh, do you remember much about living there? I remember how the houses were like, they were different from the houses here. They were unique and they were hand built and they meant a lot because you build them yourselves and... Uh, uh, what did you build them out? What did people build them out of? What, whatever they could find? Um, different people built them out of different things. Some people, I guess, used brick. Some people used mud. Some people used straw. They were okay. all different. So, but the whole family, the parents and the children, would gather the things and build the house together. So the house was really your house. It was a home. More, I mean, Americans buy a house. Yeah. And, and, and I guess we make it ours by what we put inside uh -huh. and when we paint it and things like that. But it's not quite the same yeah. as building it. So you think the people there had a really close connection to their house. Yeah. What else do you, anything else you remember? No. No, okay. Um, now, you're from a particular tribe that lives in Uganda and in Sudan, I know, um, or South Sudan now, the Acholi tribe, um, which is a sort of medium-sized tribe. And you, your first language is, is Acholi. Yeah. Can you say hello to me? Nini. Nini? Nini. Okay. <laughs> okay. How old were you when you learned English? When you, when you started, um, you told me you don't remember learning English, but you must have been about what? Five, I think. Five or so? Yeah. Okay. And, and your English is very good. And I asked you another question the other day. I asked you what language you think you think in. Yeah. And you said? Both. Both you think. Okay. How was your childhood growing up here different from the childhood of other American kids? Because you've been here since you were three, so you have a lot of American friends, I'm yeah. sure, especially once you started school. Uh, how do you think it's different growing up as a, an Acholi girl in a, in a family of four and growing up as an American girl in a family of four? How's it different? Um, well, I feel like I am more responsible and mature than my friends because by the time I was nine, I already knew how to clean the house and um, in my household, you're responsible for your things. You're responsible for your room and everything pretty much always has to be clean. But I feel like at my friend's house. Your American friend's house. My yeah. American yeah. friend's yeah. house. Um, they rely on their parents to do that for them. So their parents cook for them, their parents clean for them, and um, yeah, so they rely on their parents for almost everything. And, and you are again, how old are you? I'm 12 now. And I think that what you just said is probably very accurate. You are in many ways more responsible than most 12 year olds that I taught when I taught public school. I mean, uh, I, I'm always saying, how old are you? Right? Cool. And I think it's because you act more mature than, than an American child the same age, um, uh, which is, I, I don't know, I think it's good and it has some downsides, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, were your parents tough on you 
compared to your American friends? I mean, uh, what happens when your American friends don't get good grades or, or do something wrong? What do you think, compared to how you might have been disciplined by your parents? Um, well, we get our report cards, and then the next day my friends will be like, oh, I got a long lecture about how I need to do better in math or something. But um, I would get disciplined differently, depending on if I did good or bad. Um, I would get a good job or something like that. Um, if but, you did well, yeah. Yeah, but if I didn't do well, then um, they wouldn't show that they were disappointed, but I could tell they were disappointed because they want the best for me because they didn't, they didn't get the chances that I got. And so, yeah. So it's part of, of that's pressure. discipline, but I think part of it also, in your family anyway, yeah. is that your mom and dad talk to you about the opportunities you have and how important an education will be for you because they didn't have those same yeah. chances. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, yeah, Americans take a lot of things for granted. I'm going to say that very honestly. Not everybody, but many do. Um, now, you have a brother, right? Do you think it's the same in your family for the way your brother is treated and you are treated, or in general with, with African families? Do you think the boys are treated differently than the girls? Yeah. I feel like um, my family, not just the people in my household, but my like all my family, mm -hmm. uncles what's and aunts, called extended family. Yeah. yeah, I feel like they're all stereotypical. Like to them, guys are just supposed to know how to fix their bike or fix the TV when it's broken, <laughs> but the girls are supposed to know how to do the dishes and cook and clean, and yeah. I <laughs> so you, I don't agree with it. Yeah, no. so you said that when you were, what, eight or nine, you were already cleaning the house and yeah. taking care of younger brothers. But your brother might not have been doing the same thing at that age, and he might still not be doing some of those things. Um, no, he helps around and cleans sometimes. He's actually kind of used to it because he lives with three other girls. Ah, okay. <coughs> So yeah. he's outnumbered. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But but in general, in a larger extended African family, and I'm going to ask Bazia a little bit about that too in a minute. Um, but you play sports now. You've played yeah. several different sports, and you play now on a team. There are both a basketball team. Yeah. With both boys and girls, um, and supposedly now it's equal. But do you think when you're playing? just with all kinds of kids, Americans, Africans, all kinds of kids, do you think the boys and the girls on the same team are treated the same way? No. There are two girls on the team, me and my other friend, Haley. And if one of the boys have the ball and I'm open or Haley's open and nobody else is open, it's just the two of us, they still won't pass to us because they think, oh, they're girls, they're going to get the ball stolen for them, or they're going to lose control of the ball. They can't dribble like us because we're boys, and they're not even supposed to be here. They don't know how to play as well as us. They need to be on their own girl team with so, their own level. So the thing in the head players. is still there. Yeah, so they won't pass to you even if you are open. They'll look around for a boy or their friend and pass to them even if, they would be better off passing to you. And yeah, it's they don't play fair, but there's nothing you can do. And you and I talked about this too uh, a little while ago. I said, well, maybe we should just give up. You know, there's something called Title IX that insisted that girls' sports and boys' sports be equal. And, and then in the last 10 or 15 years, they now have mixed teams much more often than they used to. So, you know, I said to you, well, maybe we should just go back to the old way. But you had a comment about that, an opinion. What do you think? Should we just put the girls on one team and the boys on the other and forget about this no. equality thing? No. Um no matter how many times they tell you that you're not as good as them, you, 
you still have to prove them wrong because just running away from the problem isn't going to make a difference. Yep. You have to show them that you are as good as them. And if you're not as good as them, then you have to show them that you're better than them. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, you just, um, yeah. You don't give up. No, don't give up. Thank you. We may come back to you, but I'd want everybody to remember what Tutu said because I think it's a much deeper message than just about playing basketball. Yeah. Um, Bazia has been working closely with some of the adults in the South Sudanese community here, and he uh, had a very interesting experience just in the last week with one group of people who were uh, from South Sudan, the Zandi tribe. Uh, why don't you uh, tell everybody a little bit about uh, how that happened? It was a planning a Christmas party, I believe, was what was happening. Yeah, it was uh, kind of a small gathering and how to plan the party for Christmas. When one of the things, because <clears throat> according to the African culture, they almost put the lady to cover the food and all that. But uh, when, when I was there, I was just kind of listening what is going on. And I think what is helping me, I'm a man, I don't believe in complaint, but I believe in what's the next move. We can talk 10 hours, two hours, but what's the next move? So I realized um, to make idea of the manual of if you're doing a party tradition, supposed to be different uh, food. But Christmas is something supposed to be large in the purpose of Christmas, how the family to be together. So since the lady said they can't even stand behind the onion and other, it was going <laughs> over the limit. It's a lot way. of work, yeah. a lot of work. So I decided we, like a man in the same meeting, we said we're going to help and we're going to try to eliminate the way they cook because we don't want like heavy food. We need everything light, or chicken light, or, mm -hmm. or meat light. Everything could be light and, and to be in a small plate. And so it's some, if, like I think you told me that if this was a, um, a gathering to remember someone who had died or a, a very important traditional celebration, there are certain foods that would have to be yeah, served. That, that's, but this is an American Christmas party. Yeah, uh, that's supposed to be in something light, uh, what I'm uh, okay. concerned. It's uh, day for Jesus born and to bring people together. Right, and, and if you're bringing people together, then you don't want just the men and the children enjoying the food and the women going, Oh, I'm so tired of peeling onions, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the things. And, um, and we try to, to take that idea of just the woman who cook or who she, the one, do everything. And it was a good time because the men shared to be cook with the ladies, even in the kitchen, even to cut the onion. And it was good. And, um, and I'm hoping we're going to add more change in the society of South Sudanese in the general because we're working out through to take an idea of name of tribe because still they're connected to those small things. And when we became a nation, we need to talk about what means became a nation. Because a tribe, I, I don't really buy in the way it is, but I'm proud to just say I'm from South Sudan. Only if you're going to ask me Pacific according to South Sudan have 10 instead, I think that would make more sense. Because okay. sometimes I feel like we limit ourselves. <coughs> and we try to, to be under kind of group. And when you see the passport, you don't see Asholi tribe, you don't see Zandi right. tribe, you don't see Denka tribe, you don't see Muru tribe. They will say South Sudan. I think uh, through this, what I'm doing, what I believe, I think we need to start raising a different perspective. And, and this is one of the things, even myself, when you ask me, where are you from? I almost say from Africa. I don't go Pacific because it doesn't make sense. But, but I think part of this, and, and you were telling me this not too long ago, that part of the problem is that some of the people have never been more than 10 miles from where they were born until they got on a plane you know, and came here. In other words, the tribe, the village, the little small area they grew up in 
was all many of them knew. So to suddenly start seeing a, a, not just a, a state and then a country and then the whole world, is a, it's a huge step. Um, and in a, in a, I'm also thinking in a marriage, if you have a man and woman who come here married with three or four children, and the wife has always done the cooking, she's always done the cleaning, she's always done all these traditional things. You, you said to me, it, it can't happen overnight. How is it gonna change? How is the attitude between the men and the women and the families towards their children, how is it gonna change? Uh, for me, uh, if you think what I'm doing through the project and, and, and change have to be two people the mother and the kids and the mother she's the one who all the time was a kid and and this is the one other thing through my project you see I work a lot of time with a young lady because maybe I can say example like Tutu right now I'm trying to give her to be who she is not what we want her to be That's right. and, and, and other thing we need to to talk about what we have in the back in the day but the, the culture he need to be updating. It cannot be 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we want to just say, oh, that's the way it go. No, time requires things change. And uh, I believe uh, since South Sudan be starting off fighting or whatever, since 1955 until 2005, South Sudan became a country, we need to be able to take the, the good part of what we went through and transfer to this young generation. And, and it requires a lot of discussion and Discussions, slow changes. Changes and you have to be open the, uh, talking of ideas, uh, you know. And I, and I want everybody to start talking about, I'm from South Sudan before you say I'm from Asholi, I'm from Zande, I'm from Munuer. Because when you go to the level of the national, you don't say I'm Asholi. Even in your passport, they don't put Asholi, they put South Sudan. And I think that mean people are sad united. But when I see in, in the TV of South Sudan talk about united, united, you don't unite people just a word. You need to be practicing the visual. That's right. That's why the really change. And, and I, I wanna close our little discussion today by asking you a question I forgot to ask you. When you're a parent, which I know is probably long down the road, but are you going to raise your children the same way you were raised with that much responsibility when they were little? What's, what's the downside of that? Um, yes, actually, because I feel like it prepares you for things in the future, and there's only so much you can teach your children, and then one day they're off on their own. Yes, you're right. And you have to do the best you can do Mm -hmm. And I think that you, it's good to start early. Okay. So if I can teach my daughter to ride a bike at only age four, then I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. If I can teach my son how to do the dishes at age seven, then I'm going to do it. Good. And your dream, I'd like to share that as a closing note. What is your dream? What do you want to do when you get, go, when you go away to college and then get an education? I want to be a surgeon. A surgeon, wow. A special kind, I think you told me. Um, either a brain surgeon or a cosmetic surgeon. Cosmetic surgeon? Is yes. It? Oh, okay. Wow, that's a terrific career. I wish you a lot of luck. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm Ann Smith, uh, speaking for Project Bazir. Thank you very much.